should we start? Yeah, the <laughs> idea was you were gonna um, give us some update on your Act 46 experience? Yes, well, and also school budgets in general. Please. Um, okay, so I'm at this point where I have to sometimes have my glasses on and sometimes not because I'm middle-aged, so I will try my best. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to reintroduce myself because I know that all of you know me in a totally different context, and so I wanted to tell you about me as um, a school budget person. Um, so I'm Ruth Hardy, and I wanted to thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, for having me, and um, Senator Bray for inviting me. It's an honor to talk to you all. Um, and I am, uh, a me I am actually, at this point, as of 10 days ago, a, a former member of the ACSD school board. I did not run for re-election. Um, but I was first elected in 2010 to the ID4 um, school board, which is the Middlebury Elementary School Board. And um, then, and as soon as I was elected to that, I became part of their regional education district um, study committee, the RED study committee, which is a precursor to Act 46, as you probably know. Um, and I also um, was on the supervisory union board, um, which is the board of boards, mm -hmm. and um, was re-elected in 2013 and became chair of the ID4 board. Um, I, also, I also then chaired our study committee, our Act 46 study committee, <coughs> um, and I started my career as a fiscal analyst for the Wisconsin Legislative Fiscal Bureau, which is the equivalent of your JFO, mm -hmm. and my assignment was school finance analysis. So I did all of their um, analysis in the 90s um, for their school finance system, and that included a massive change from one that um, was primarily uh, property tax based to one that was two thirds funded by income tax. So oh, um, let's just say I've been there before. <laughs> um, exactly, so it's, it's interesting to see this happening here. Um, I also was um, the assistant budget director at Middlebury College for seven years. So I am a budget person and school and um, education budget um, expert, I will say. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, I'm sort of known in Middlebury as the person who can explain school budgets and have done so in my community for the past eight years pretty frequently um, at town meetings, school meetings, libraries, in the grocery store, you know, <laughs> an, a, over coffee, in right. front of my kids over and over again. To the relief of many hundreds and hundreds. <laughs> yes. I think a lot of people are happy that I can explain it and, and then they feel more confident about what's going on with their schools. Mm -hmm. um, so our um, Act 46 merger um, was successfully voted on two years ago in 2016, exactly two years ago. Um, and uh, our district, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is... Uh, Would you mind just pointing it out behind you? Yeah. It is Addison Central School District, this one. Mm -hmm. And it's um, seven towns, um, Bridport, Cornwall, Middlebury, Ripton, Salisbury, Shoreham, and Weybridge. Them alphabetically memorized, mm -hmm. um, and it's it's an interesting district as they all are in Vermont, <laughs> because Middlebury is kind of the urban school. It's right. much much bigger, and Ripton is at the other end of the spectrum. It's super tiny, right. um, so we have this big divide between um, size and a lot of the things that we see in other parts of the country playing out actually play out in our district with urban suburban and rural mm -hmm. so cornwall and weybridge kind of act as the the suburban districts they mm -hmm. are the higher income they have the lowest poverty rates mm -hmm. until we merged weybridge was the highest spending district right. in the state we remember yeah <laughs> so um and middlebury was in the middle sort of the average almost exactly at the average spending so we took that kind of range and merged them together into one district um so we had nine we have nine schools a union middle and high school and we had nine school boards um, each of the elementary schools had one then the high school middle school had a union board and then we had the supervisory union board um, so we came from nine down to one within a course of several years. Um, the, um, 
and it was overwhelmingly approved. Um, it was not a close vote, and the, the only town where it was even partly close was Ripton. Um, but other than that, it was a really overwhelmingly approved merger. And I think one of the reasons is, is because of the process we used. Um, and uh, prior to uh, merging for Act 46, the red study that we did, um, we did a ton of community engagement. We had community circles and talking to people in the community about emerging. Um, but one of the things we found at the end when we asked people, what questions do you still have after 18 months of community engagement, the, mass, the major question everybody still had was, what's the financial impact? What will this do to our school budgets? What will this do to my taxes? What will this do to the education of my kids in terms of spending? Um, so I was really determined as the budget girl in my community to um, answer that question when we did our Act 46 study committee. So I chaired that committee. It also happened to coincide with um, being between jobs, so I had a lot of extra time, and I created a, uh, a model for our district, a financial model, um, much like I did back in the day in Wisconsin when we were looking at changes at, at the statewide level. I did it at the, at the school district level. To, um, to be able to answer people's questions town by town, school by school, what would the impact be on my district and my taxes? Um, and I went kind of on the road with this presentation. And I did get pushback because there were people, um, especially in the higher spending districts like Weybridge, who didn't want that sort of information out there, that kind of comparison across districts. Why does Weybridge spend more than Middlebury? Um, but Middlebury, my town, where most of the voters were, really, really wanted to know. Um, so I did, uh, I had charts and graphs and a whole bunch of information and, and I really tried to, as much as possible, uh, present all the information, uh, I guess the best word is with empathy, so that everybody felt like their town wasn't being the target of the information, but that it was just presented as this is what would happen. and. Um, um, during this time, uh, we also got a new superintendent who was supposed to be here with me today but couldn't make it. Um, and that was a huge impact on the process. Um, it was a big leadership change for the better. He's a very good superintendent, but that helped the process enormously. Um, and he came in and created a strategic plan and worked on a strategic plan, so they're simultaneous to our study committee. So that was really helpful that we had this financial and governance plan, and we also had an educational and um, sort of student services plan going on simultaneously. And I think that was uh, a big um, benefit to the whole process. Um, then uh, the study committee, um, presented its report, and it was, I think, the third district in the state to have its Act 46 plan approved. Um, and like I said, it was overwhelmingly supported. So you still have tax incentives playing out? Yes, in FY19, we're in the second year, we're in the eight cents. Okay. So we got in and got the full tax incentives, and that was one of the reasons we yeah. immediately jumped on it and did it in less than a year so that we could get that. Um, but I don't think we could have done that had we not done this groundwork, had mm -hmm. we not had the red study, had we not had a good leader, had we right. frankly not had somebody like me who could do the financial analysis. Right. Um, one of the things we didn't have was such a good, was at the time a very good uh, uh, business manager. So I sort of did the analysis that a lot of business managers are doing in other states. Now we have a great business manager, but then we didn't. <laughs> um, so uh, we, when it, after it passed, um, one of the first things that the new board did was actually approve a completely new curriculum for our school district. Um, we're moving to the International Baccalaureate curriculum, mm -hmm. which if you're familiar with is a pretty intensive curriculum. Um, and we're doing the full K-12 um, international baccalaureate, so not just the diploma program, but the early years, middle years, and diploma program all at the same time. So we're um, implementing that as we are sort of implementing this new, new um, finance and governance structure. Um, the first year of our budget for FY, the, cur the current year that we're living in right now, the FY18 budget was we just we decided to do just a carry forward forward budget. So we tried to keep everybody's budgets just where they were and carry them forward with the necessary pluses and minuses. 
um, and tried also to keep everybody's tax rates as equal as possible so one town didn't feel mm -hmm. um, like they were getting the short stick. So we did do what you guys did and we used some reserve funds in order to buy down the tax rate for Middlebury because mm -hmm. Middlebury is the town that's going to have the biggest impact tax-wise because it was the lowest spending town. Mm -hmm. Um, so we did that in the first year, um, and we mostly did it because we'd done so much change all at the same time yeah. that we wanted people to feel stability. Sure. Um, the second year budget, this was this year, and I chaired the finance committee, and it was pretty much my last, uh, my goal. If I can get this budget through, then I felt like it was okay for me to step away for yeah. a little bit and do something else. Um, and we knew from the beginning that it was going to be a really tough budget, not only from what we were hearing from, from Montpelier, from the legislature, the governor, from the VSBA, from everybody up here, um, but also you know, looking at our own demographics. We, like almost every other school district, has declining enrollments, especially in our smaller rural schools and actually at our high school and middle school. Um, we expect to have 50 fewer students in our high school next year and 30 fewer students in our middle school. So you know, a big enough impact that we felt like we could change the budget. It's not, an, it wasn't an incremental change. It was a big, you know, all at once change in, in enrollments. Um, so one of the things that I really emphasized as chair of the finance committee was that we needed to be clear about what our goals were and what our message was to voters. Um, so I um, immediately set out the goals uh, for the committee. We talked about them and what what we wanted to do with this budget. And the three things we, we really emphasized were long-term sustainability for our district. How can we continue to be the excellent district that's implementing IB and has good leadership and community support? How can we sustain that? Um, how can we enhance equity, which was one of the major goals of Act 46 and one that often gets forgotten. Um, but we were really clear that equity had to be part of this budget and how did we budget things to, to enhance equity and that we wanted to be fiscally responsible. Um, I, and I, I wish your Republican colleagues were here to hear me say this, <laughs> I, am a, I call myself a fiscal pragmatist mm -hmm. and you know I really feel like it, when we're spending taxpayers' money we have to spend it wisely and responsibly and that just more is not always better and in some cases it's worse. Mm -hmm. And so I am really, I, I often will tell people that I've never seen a budget that I can't cut. Um, you know, when you understand budgets, you can always find something to cut. And so I, I am not. I just wanted to make sure that uh, we were budgeting in a way that was responsible. Um, so we really looked at um, where we were seeing declining enrollments and where we were um, seeing changes um, in demographics, basically. Um, so we knew the high school, there was there was opportunity for reductions and the middle school, and then in some of our elementary schools we looked at where could we combine classroom classes so we could have like a third, fourth grade or something like that. And we reduced, um, we first came, when, when we thought our um, uh, enrollments were going to be even lower, we had a, a much more stringent bu uh, budget reduction. Um, where we were proposing to reduce 34 positions. Wow. And I, as the chair of the finance committee, sat in front of a completely packed sure. room and, and, and explained the budget to people. And I, it was not comfortable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, um, you know, so a lot of my friends that night were not my friends. <laughs> and um, then that week, one of the things that I find really challenging as local school board member is that the timing of everything is so difficult, the timing of from when we get information from the state and the crunch time period in which we have to budget because town meeting is so early. Yeah. So I would love to see town meeting later in the year <laughs> um, because giving uh, local school districts more time to put together their mm -hmm. budgets would be extremely helpful. Um, but in this one week period, we got our enrollment numbers from the state. Hi, Brad. Hi, Brad. I'm so excited on your warm up. <laughs> um, we got our, our, our enrollment numbers from Brad and they were higher than we expected. And so uh, I was uh, actually um, uh, celebrating Hanukkah with my family and I got a text from our superintendent saying, check your email, our, our equalized pupil numbers are up early, are up high. It's a Hanukkah miracle. Exactly. <laughs> so the next day at a meeting yeah. I said, it was a Hanukkah miracle. Yeah. <laughs> 
and um, we were able to pull back on some of our budget reductions because how, of how that. How many positions ultimately were uh, ripped? Um, n only one and a half were actually ripped, mm -hmm. but um, we were able to do almost everything through attrition and early retirements. Okay. We had um, nine teaching positions, I believe, and mm -hmm. six paraprofessionals and a half admin position. Um, in the end, but it did start out as 32 FTEs, so it, we were able to back off on a lot of it. Um, but what we did when we looked at the teachers, like I said, we targeted it, and we we did look at the, the thing that everybody seems to love to talk about, which is ratios. We did look at ratios, but we created our own ratios. We didn't use the ratios that were sort of being perpetrated or whatever. Uh, at the state level. Um, we were really looking at um, teaching um, class size ratios rather than um, full FTE of, of licensed professionals in a building. And as I was explaining to Chris when I met with him that we, you know, we had, we wanted to see who is actually in the classroom with the kids. There are a lot of positions in schools that aren't teachers, but they're still licensed professionals. So nursing, guidance, um, school psychologists um, and and also even in our elementary school there are licensed teachers but they are not classroom teachers in the same way so like your music teacher your librarian those kinds of things so we really took um, those out we looked at rate multiple ratios but we tried to look at sort of the reality ratios and and enhance equity across the board um, so um, we did end up with a budget that reduced about um, 11 or 12 posi FTE positions. We offered an a early retirement incentive, and I think 30, 36 people are taking it, so we're having a pretty big um, retirement. Um, mm -hmm. And we only had to actually riff one and a half positions, so that was a benefit. Um, and um, we we did have an overall budget reduction of 1.3% in expenditures and a reduction of per pupil spending of 1.8% in, in the end. Um, our revenue also was down, partly because we had used some revenue last year, but also our state and federal revenue is declining. Um, so um, we, I think in the end, we're able to do exactly, you know, one of the reasons why Senator Bray reached out to me is he read in the paper, well, you guys did what we asked. Mm -hmm. You reduced your budget. <laughs> and, we, and also the, <clears throat> frankly, the personnel, I, which is one of the hardest things right. because as, yes. you, as you implied, people are so connected to their teachers that it's, it's uh, really, really difficult to even have one teacher that's not carried forward by attrition. Yep. Um, so the, the fact that you were able to find the size of the savings that you did yep. is, is pretty remarkable. Yeah, I mean, thank you for saying that. I think we worked really hard, and I, and I was very adamant that we were going to do what we needed to do. Um, and we also enhanced equity because when you looked when we looked at class sizes and expenditures per pupil, we we always calculate on a school by school basis too, so we can look across our district. Our our um, expenditures per pupil and our class sizes are getting closer together. So even in the largest school to the smallest school, there used to be a huge difference between Middlebury and Weybridge, and they are coming together closer. So we feel like we met all of our goals that we set out to do. Um, the one thing and. The one thing that was a big theme throughout was because we're moving to international baccalaureate, there were a lot of parents and teachers who kept saying, are we still going to be able to do IB? Are we still going to be able to do IB? So we, we were constantly checking in, making sure, yes, we are still going to be able to do it. These cuts are not going to affect that. Um, so next year, we'll have 50 fewer students in our district as a whole. and. That won't show up in an articulized pupil count until the following year. So for our FY19 budget, or FY20 budget, that will actually come into our articulized pupil count. So we know that we're going to have to continue to reduce in order to, um, to uh, meet the, the declining enrollment. 
Um, so we really looked for opportunities for further efficiencies. Now I won't be at the table to implement these efficiencies, but there's definitely room for administrative um, reductions. Right now we have principal in every single building, full-time principals. So a school with 45 kids has a full-time principal and a school with 450 kids has right. a full-time principal. Yeah. So there's definitely um, opportunity there. There's opportunity across the district for systems, and this is one thing that I think is really uh, across the state we see this is that uh, everybody has different food service everybody has different transportation everybody has different technology we ha we literally started this year with seven different phone companies or something like that so so really getting all of those onto the same page will uh, allow us to find efficiencies there yeah. Um, our largest school is overly staffed with paraeducators. Um, I was really adamant that we um, that we focus on if we're saving positions, they be licensed teacher positions, um, because uh, there's a lot of studies that are coming out of all over the place. But mm -hmm. AOE has done one about the overuse of paraeducators in our state, and I do think I see that in our district. The other thing that was excluded from Act 46, and I think there's opportunity, is taking a better look at technical education and career centers. Um, they were not included in the Act 46 um, uh, plan, and our career center, I think there's opportunity for us to work with them um, better and bring them into the fold. Um, so, you know, one of the things that Senator Bray and I talked about when we met in person a few uh, last week was things that you all could do that are not directly related to education, but that would have an effect on school spending and more than that, uh, how do we serve our students? <coughs> one, of, one of the things that we did increase is we added two school psychologist positions. So even though we were reducing in other areas, we still needed to add school psychologist positions because we're seeing such a need for school psychologists. Um, and so uh, thinking more holistically, and I know that you're working on this, but I think it would have an effect on school districts is mental health services and how do we bolster up mental health services so that schools are not the stop gap for families and kids who need mental health services because that is we're seeing that more and more and more. Um, also housing, we're seeing more um, homeless kids and um, requiring transporting homeless kids from outside of district and it's really expensive to do so. And of course, if kids don't have stable housing, then they're not able to learn. So um, really trying to um, focus uh, investments in housing would help our education system. And finally, um, I would put a plug in for paid family leave. Um, if you have families who are able to um, take time off and um, be there with their families when a new baby comes or an adopted kid, that's going to help families at, as a whole be more stable and more stable families that are better for school. Um, so paid family leave and early investments in early childhood education. Um, I, those are not all directly in education budgets, but if you invest in those, then it will help our schools and it will help um, enable our schools to reduce budgets in a way that um, is not harmful to kids. Um, I also would say that um, protecting um, uh, bargaining rights of teachers is extremely important. If you look across the country at states that have um, and I know I'm speaking to the choir, Wisconsin exactly. I saw it happening in Wisconsin when I was there. Um, but uh, protecting the rights of, of uh, labor to bargain with their employers. Um, um, and also just remembering that education jobs are actually real jobs in our communities and that when you cut those jobs, you're, you're cutting, you're cutting a, a well-paying, um, highly um, educated job um, from, from our towns. and especially in rural parts of Vermont. Those are, those are some of the best jobs that there are in our communities. And so really thinking about it in that perspective too, that um, this isn't just uh, education, this is actually jobs. <laughs> um, so um, those are the things I would caution as you move forward. Um, it, I was really disappointed last week when the governor came out saying that he wanted to further cut education after school districts did what we were asked to do and we worked really, really hard. Um, the rate of change for school districts has been enormous. I stand before my community for five years in a row and say I'm not really sure what's going to happen next year, but this is the best I can tell you for this year. And I'm the one that's at my town meeting doing this. and. 
and and so I would just caution I know that there's another big bill to make massive change to the education system and it may be the right direction to move in but school districts need to absorb, absorb. Mm -hmm. they need to have time for Act 46 to take effect we're only in our second year and we're we were one of the first districts to do it so making sure that you're giving school districts the time to do their work and know that they are they are committed to doing that work um, and uh, just to be careful of the rhetoric that's coming out of Montpelier because it's disheartening for school board members, for parents, and for teachers. What rhetoric in particular? The, the sort of constant drumbeat of we need to cut, cut, cut. I mean, you know, school board, schools are so expensive. Um, you know, school boards aren't doing what they're supposed to do. We need, you know, teachers are, there are too many teachers. And I, I think that really focusing on making sure that we're, um, one of the things when I was uh, at, in the budget office at Middlebury College during the worldwide financial downturn, and we had to make pretty big cuts at Middlebury College, um, we had this mantra of protect the academic core. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't cut anything from our, our the academic programs at the college. We cut all in the outside. We targeted budget reductions. And I think that targeting budget reductions to things that are going to have the least impact on our kids mm -hmm. is where we need to to be doing it, not across the board kind of, we're gonna just cut by mm -hmm. you know, the claw back that you all did last year or whatever. Um, those are the things that are harmful to the long range planning and long range uh, sustainability of our school districts. So really enabling school districts to do the work that they have to and not putting sort of uh, imp imposing um, uh, restrictions or budget reductions that aren't thoughtful. I think is really important to, to consider. So. I agree. We were we were over a barrel last year, as as legislatures are with their executives a, a lot. Um, the governor's setting up a similar um, sort of rhetorical framework for this year. Um, I hope it doesn't wind up the same way with you know this arbitrary attempt to lower or to hold the tax rate steady yeah as though that's the only good that we're talking about but uh, rest assured that we will do our best to make sure that it's if, if there's anything that comes about in the way of cuts that they will be targeted and exclusive of the academic mission the core instructional yeah mission. I, I hope so, and uh, you know, as you know, budgets overwhelmingly passed in communities across the state, and I think that that was voters saying we're okay with these. We think our school boards are doing a good job. Um, they're working hard. They're they're responsive. They are at our town meetings. They are right here in our communities. They're at our grocery stores, <laughs> and um, so I think it's really important to um, respect the decisions that the voters made in terms of the school budgets too. Um, you know, one of the term that occurs to me is talking about um, helping schools continue to evolve productively. Mm -hmm. it, is still, it comes out of our experience around uh, from Irene. Resilience really entered the vocabulary of a lot of planning, and it makes me think, you know, schools are going to continue to face challenges, and we, help, we need to help them be more resilient, not just cheaper. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's really great, and actually that came up at some of our meetings when we had, um, you know, people complaining um, about reductions and things. It was really, well, we, we expect our kids to be resilient, and we try to teach our kids to be resilient, and um, we hope that the grown-ups who are involved in these decisions are also exhibiting resilience, and that change is, is okay if we are doing it in a way that is respectful. So... Um, well, I thank you very much for... Do we have time for a question? We would have had you been here on time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, you were 10 minutes late and some of you were 40 minutes late. Why don't you say you were better had a better excuse? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank Smack you. talk, you guys. Yeah, really. <laughs> I need you to come down and talk to my district. I, I would love to. I would love to come yes. and talk to any of your districts. Um, not nice and orange and big. Yeah, I'll come talk to your districts, Orca, too. 
I, I'm, I think I was always a big proponent of Act 46, and I think if we give it time to do its job, it will work in the way that you all intended it to. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank I'm sorry you. you missed. I would love to uh, chat with you more. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Brad, do you want to join us? I would love to. Brad, hey. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. you know you're a fan club. <laughs> Attention, I have to be honest. <laughs> so, you know why you're here. So much for the fan club. <laughs> um, it's the age old yeah. question of um, school choice and the decision, the original decision to not require that any money change hands. Um, and <laughs> so now we have. Uh, Senator Rogers' bill, but it's the latest iteration of the request. Yeah. Is is there any way that we I can think we have, have this already? We have this. Some oh, okay. Yes. Uh, oh, that's right. Just to bring Gene it up. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> you're right. This comes up all the time. Yeah. Um, I haven't talked about it for a while. I was a little surprised when it came up this morning. I said, what? <laughs> So, um, for the record, Brad James, Agency of Education. Um, basically, what I did is I spent the morning kind of trying to collect my thoughts and put them down yeah. as, to, as to what it is. So I'm just kind of go through, kind of go through this. And since I don't memorize things particularly well anymore, I, I will look at this. But the first one that came to my mind was the special ed education costs. If you if you transfer the the ADM from the district of residence to wherever public high school choice are going to that district, who pays for the special education? Federal law, I believe, and other people in the room can probably correct me because I'm not an expert on federal law. But federal law, I believe, says it's the district of residence that pays for that. Yes, and we're not. Um, I'm not sure what John's bill does, but this this is directed at general choice and not. Oh, oh, okay. I completely okay. So here, here, let me let me tell you where I what I what I thought the charge was. I, I, I took I took a quick look at what Senator Rogers' bill was, and that yeah. was just basically having money money be paid for public high school choice. Yes. And then my understanding was that instead of that, you would be looking at having the ADM go. So it's it's the same it's the same thing. Yes. It's that that's kind of that is so I'm coming from the right place. And okay, um, but it's essentially um, the question becomes then if if the cost for special education stays at the at the resident district. But the ADM is now over here at another district. Then their cost per pupil has just gone up. Yes. Um, um, and and so this is the you know the trade-off is that the way it is now, uh, John has a district that is taking in thirty-six more students from out of district or something like that. Yeah. Um, I don't yes. know. Is they're all public high school choice then? Is is he talking Lake Region? Yeah, I think it's North yeah. Country. North Country. I think I think there's more of an exodus in North Country than in. In any event, in could be, the example in was: region. let's take 25 okay. students that that um, exit their home district and and are drawn to another one. Yeah. South Burlington is another example. Yeah. You get kids from the island as far away as Alberg yeah. and North Hero would come down, um, and so let's say that's 50 kids. Um, as it stands, I get complaints from South Burlington, John gets complaints, um, but if you changed it, so the ADM followed, you would get complaints from the districts that were losing the kids. Um, we still have a governor on how many of those students can go, right? Yes. Um, but the, the short question is, is there any way to um, track that those students, whether we want to do it or not, is it possible to track the students in the ADM and to accurately depict in the ADM where they are being educated rather than their home district? Yes. Uh, I, I think we need to differentiate and make sure everybody's clear. Because okay. when I was hearing you, what you said, you, it sounded like you were kind of con kind of um, conflating both public high school choice and regular tuition. So the islands are regular tuition. They don't yeah. operate schools. 
Okay. So, so, the, so they're coming. No, I'm talking about high school and short. Right, yeah. but 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 the kids from the islands are coming, um, and that that's where the vast majority of South Burmese kids okay. are coming from, and they're bringing the money with them because yeah. they are from touristy towns. If you have a if you have a situation, um, and I'll go to I'll go to Senator Rogers, John. I can't remember when he covers exactly, but from North Country and Lake Region, as, as I recall from the last set of data that I saw, there are more kids going from North Country that are coming to Lake Region. And so I, the number that's sticking in my head is like 10, somewhere around them, but I, I could be completely wrong on that. Um, but what's happening then is if you have 10 kids coming in, the money is not coming with them. Right. Okay, and I, and I think that's, that's, that's the complaint. The question is, are you really incurring additional costs? Going back to your initial question, can we, can we track the students? Yes, we can, and, and, and we do. Um, and and we're, we're talking about uh, somewhere between 350 and 400 kids annually is how many kids we're talking about statewide who, who partake in public high school choice, which is only open to 9th through 12th graders. Um, we do put out a, an annual report um, that I think comes to you guys uh, that, that kind of delineates where the kids are going, where they're coming from. We don't say this child is going from here to here, but we can, we can find those. We can see that data, but that's not what the report is saying. But it is saying that these are the net sending schools, these are the net receiving schools. Um, so we, we can track them to, to get to get to that point. Um, so we, we do know. Um, I think the complaint is, is there an additional cost with these kids as they come in? Most schools have capacity. Um, I, I, if you have, if you had 10 10th graders come in all at once in a small school, then there could be a cost. But if you have 10 kids all together come in spread across four grades, there probably isn't going to be much of a cost at all. But, but even so, we could change the ADM to more accurate, accurately reflect where they are. Well, you, you could, but, I, but, I, but ADM does a lot of different things. ADM, I started out with special education, just who pays. But the other, ADM is also used to, to fund, to allocate out IDAB money mm -hmm. and also state um, special education block, block grants under current law. So if you change that, that ADM count as move, removing kids from this resident district to another district over here, no, I, you're going to be shorting them. I understand there would be, um, there would be, in a way, it's like getting rid of phantom students, right? You're, you're, you're returning them to the actual state of affairs rather than now they're enjoying a higher ADM even though they're not educating all of those kids because they're sending 20 of them or 25 of them. Yes, yeah, in, in, in that sense, yes, I, I, can, I can agree with that analogy. Yeah. The question is, is their cost gonna go down if they have five kids leave? Right. And, and the answer from talking to business managers, not really. Can, um, can I ask this as a way to close the loop with Senator Rogers? Can you give me the most up-to-date version of the, the breakdown of where those sure. 350 to 400 kids are going? Sure. And we'll, we'll mess around with that a little bit and see, you know, it, it may be that the situations are, you know, minimal in all but three or four cases. And then could we develop some sort of limited thing for those cases, in other words? Sure. Um, Require a payment district to district or something if you exceed See a certain number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But most most districts have kids going out. Most districts have kids coming in. Yeah, or I should say high schools. Let me rephrase that. Um, You're saying at the same not, time. At the same time. Not, but but it's, but sometimes they break even. Sometimes there's a plus. Sometimes there's a minus. You know, but it's right in the simple. So, sometimes there are big disparities depending on where yeah. they are. And I think that's what you're you're yes. more interested. Okay, sure. Okay. I can I can do that. Well, thank you, Brad. That's sure. that's all my questions. Any other questions? No. Thanks, Brad. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> Those are great, Brad. Stay in the room all the time. Right. That would be great. We always have questions every day. We're You're like, like, where's Brad? Brad. Only Brad is here. I'll try to show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. Okay. Yes. Yeah, what's up with the... Yeah, yeah it's cold. It's cold. Oh, no, this, this oh, is it's freezing cold. Cold. Is that shooting shit? Oh, my gosh. Cold. So, uh, we have you in the room, so I'm going to prefer the human being uh, over the phone in witness. Yeah, what a deal. All those. Okay. That's all right. I, 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 I
Association, giving some testimony today on, I'm calling H897, I don't know if you guys are calling yep. it that or not. But, uh, so, my testimony is written out, I won't read through it for you, but I'll just hit the highlights and then answer any questions that you have, best I can. Uh, so, I just basically took my thoughts and outlined them based on the sections. So, in the first section, um, you know, I think we all agree that supervisor unions need to utilize best practices educating all the kids. And I do think that the current funding mechanism gets in the way of that. And I think that, uh, I think almost every principal in the state would tell you that. I think special education directors would tell you that. I think superintendents would tell you that. And we can talk about the reason why. I gave you a couple of examples here. And essentially what happens now, it's not that principals are not trying to make the best decision they can on behalf of kids. It's more about, I have limited resources, including human capital. And so I want to use that human capital as best I can. I've got people over here that I can use with this group of students, even though it'd probably be better if I use these people, but I can't use these people, I won't get reimbursement. And if I don't use these people over there, I won't be able to use them for reimbursement. So it's a, it's a catch-22 situation. And the examples I gave were a math teacher and a paraprofessional. So you have a situation where you're trying to provide reteach or extra intervention to a, a student who needs more support than they can get in a regular classroom. Oftentimes the only person available to provide that support for a special education kid, it's a paraeducator. So you get your least trained person providing reteach support to your students that need it the most. Uh, in a census-based model, you could actually <clears throat> have your math teacher doing reteach to groups of kids regardless if they were special ed or non-special ed or high honors, it wouldn't make any difference at all. You could use your best teacher to teach the kids that are struggling the most with a given concept. So it'd make it a lot easier to regroup kids in a way that makes sense academically. So that's one of the reasons why I'm supporting the census model in, in general. Um, no, just go through the highlights. I apologize, I've got a pretty good cold going. Section two of the goals, uh, again, I'll talk about that. The current system is very cumbersome. It causes a lot of bureaucratic red tape. It makes it very tough, again, to allocate the resources in a way that makes sense. And we have a lot of educators uh, and parent educators too, they're spending a lot of time on paperwork. It has nothing to do with servicing kids. And the, the, the model that we have, because of the county, accountability provisions in there where you have to do time studies and you have to track certain things uh, that, are, that are already spelt out by federal law and, and the IEPs, when we spend so much time doing that, we have less time that we're actually spending with students and providing the services to kids that they need. In terms of early uh, implementation, I did put I'm generally supportive of the idea. Um, I think having early adopters makes sense, like a pilot at any time, makes sense. I do think that we're moving too fast on this, and I did say this to Helset. I would rather see this be something that stays in over a two, three year period. It makes me a little bit nervous. Well, it, it is uh, <clears throat> in the sense that... I mean, full adoption, I would like to see happen like 23, 24, or 24, 25. Okay. Or something along those lines. Got it. Or even even earlier than that. I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit. But the idea is, yeah. if you want it bad, you get it bad. So I'm yeah, I really want to make sure that we implement it correctly if we want to do okay. it. But I do support the concept. Um, in, current, in terms of changes to current special education law, that, that the big section four part, just a few things I wanted to highlight on. Again, I mentioned I think it's an aggressive timeline. I'm worried about it being uh, a little bit too quick. I like that it eliminates much of the reporting that's time consuming uh, and that is necessary in the reimbursement model because you're submitting to the feds to get reimbursement and they would no longer be necessary in a block model or a census model. Uh, I think that that's good. I think sometimes we think that, well, because we're doing time studies and stuff, we're really making sure we're meeting the needs of all kids. It's really not true. It's really a compliance exercise, almost a checklist type of thing. It's got nothing to do with the quality of services you provide to kids. So I think moving away from that makes perfect sense, and I think all administrators would agree with that, as with teachers. 
Uh, in terms of the extraordinary cost reimbursement, I talked about this quite a bit with House Ed uh, in and out of committee. I'm not sure if the numbers in the bill are right. Uh, I don't know what the right numbers are. Mm -hmm. I do think that it's been 50000 since the first day I was principal. Yeah. So I'm sorry, and it definitely needs to change. I think the numbers in there now are 60000 and 95%. I think I talked mm -hmm. about that a little bit later in the testimony. You mean just because inflation? Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. And what happens is, uh, well, two things. One, one thing that happens is as the cost goes up uh, for programs and stuff, more and more kids are being captured at that 50,000 foot level. And I think there's a compelling state interest for the state to make sure that that does raise up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I also think, and I mentioned that later in this report, that at a certain threshold, I think 100% of the students should be paid for by the state, just philosophically. Uh, especially when you're talking about small districts that may have their budget completely blown up. Now, since we've moved to Act 153 and we're moving towards more consolidation, especially at the supervisor union level, that is less of a concern than it, than it was previously. Well, I think, isn't it 95 over 60 in yeah. this one? Yeah, it is. And so, so that would, but you think it should, at, well, maybe at 100? What I what I talked to House Head about was something where you'd start out with, and it was a scale thing where you started out with 75% and then 85% and then 90 or 100 or something along those lines. Yeah. But I think this is, I mean, this is fine. It's better than what we have right now, I think. I think it makes more sense. Uh, let's see. Another concern that I have is around the uh, compliance with maintenance of effort. We need to make sure that whatever we do, that we have the, the right amount of funding there so that the state doesn't lose money from the feds. Yeah. Uh, and I know Emily can talk to you about this in detail. Tracy Sawyer will testify to you next week. We she can talk to you about that. Emily, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. So that's a real important concern, not to think, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna save $50 million. I mean, really, if you're looking at it from a financial lens, it should be, if we do this right, we're gonna give kids more support earlier on and it's going to have us so we have less special ed costs down the road. And second part of that would be if we can slow the growth of spending, you know, I think that's key. Uh, in my concluding thoughts, I talked a little bit about how right now the percentage that special ed is taking up in the regular general education budget, the overall operating budget, has been increasing proportionately through the last half decade, at least maybe longer than that. Mm -hmm. and, and we can't keep doing that. That, that. that really is a huge problem. That's something that we should be thinking about addressing hopeful that the census block model would address that and would help in that area. Let's see. Waiting, I'm totally supportive of that as long as I'm not the one that's doing it. Um, in terms of the consulting services, I think school systems are going to need the support to move away from the current model. Uh, essentially, we've been doing the current model for about 40 years mm -hmm. since the passage of IDEA and it's, it's really the way that our special educators have been trained and we have a, a almost a mantra in some schools where those kids as opposed to our kids and breaking down those silos is going to take some work and best practices are really clear we should have our top instructors providing the, the instruction to our most needy students and that doesn't happen in a lot of places right now because of partly at least because of the model that we're in can i ask you yeah um, jay a question that we've been kicking around since we picked up the bill and that is on the unrestricted nature of the funding um, so in the positive sense, as you said, more flexibility, you can um, break down the silos, you can um, maybe more efficiently mm -hmm. use those dollars for all the students rather than just special needs kids. The, the you know, anxiety is that by breaking down the silos, having zero restrictions on that funds, that it would begin to be fungible to the, to the rest of the system and that you could wind up um, constraining the resources for kids on IEPs or um, 504 kids. Right. Uh, thoughts on that? Well, a couple things. First of all, in terms of uh, 504 kids, those resources don't come from special education dollars anyway. Mm -hmm. They come out of the general budget anyway. Same thing with, I hate to use the word 504 kids, ESD kids, but kids that are categorized in those areas that need plans. The only area that's separate is special education. So if you got if a kid is on a 504 plan, that money's coming out of the general operating budget already. And you could have a kid on a 504 plan that has a lot more significant need than a kid who's special education yeah. for whatever reason. So to me, it makes more sense to pool the resources. I know that there's the worry about that that you yeah. articulated. I know that some advocacy groups uh, for special populations have advocated that. I'm not sure how much here, but certainly nationally, mm -hmm. um, I I think that the small size of our schools the way that the principals and teachers know all the kids, 
I think we can push the envelope with the training from DMG and other consulting groups so that people really understand what best practices are all about so that we can give the kids who need the most support the highest level of instruction regardless of whatever category they might be in. If I'm really strong at teaching, I'm just making this up, fractions, which I'm not. If I was really strong at teaching fractions in the elementary school and we had se several kids that were struggling with fractions after we'd gone through our regular unit of study, why not have me do reteach to the kids that really are struggling with fractions regardless of what grade they're in? Regardless of whether they're special education, or 504, or ELL, if I'm really strong in that, let me teach those kids. Since it's with model, you can do that easily. In a uh, reimbursable model, it's much harder to do that. So I, I definitely get your concern. It's something that merits watching. You want to make sure special education directors and superintendents and principals are on top of that. But I, I do think the greater good that was that concern from my perception. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other questions for Jay? Yeah. Well, sort of along those same lines. Um, do you, you know, we hear um, often that we have um, really too many para, para educators. Or we do. We have, you know, yeah, too many. I'll just go and say we do. Yeah, okay. Um, so what do you think will happen in, in this switch? What, what will happen to those folks? Do you think we'll let, let some of them go? Do you, do you think we should try to provide incentives for them to become teachers or what? Or, you know, uh, I think it really depends on the on the level of the para. Uh, when I was principal in South Burlington, when I was superintendent in Essex County, I had plenty of paras and I had teaching licenses. The system that I just ran nine years ago, I had zero paras and I had teaching licenses. So I think it depends on uh, where the person is at at the time. I think you lose some paras by attrition. Um, it's a very volatile field and it has quite a bit of turnover anyway. And I think that many paras are great, but. Where they're really valuable is when they're supporting a kid who really has trouble controlling themselves or some type of behavior type thing, helping them be able to access their education. To have them be the ones that are actually delivering the instruction to the kids, which in default happens a lot now. Yes. It's not appropriate and there's no research that supports that at all. So I think you'd still have parents for your, you're gonna have students that have high levels of autism or, or a, a brain impairment or some total physical handicaps that may need some support. But whenever possible, having the instruction actually come from the classroom teachers is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And my wife's a parent, so I may cost her a job, but I think it's the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, and I apologize, I might have cut you off before you were done with your section by section. Uh, the only other things I'll add, and thank you for that, is that uh, <laughs> you know, BPA is supportive, uh, very supportive of the AOE piece of this. I, Nicole and I were just talking for most of she's still here. One of the, one of the things I think we do in Vermont is we keep adding more and more stuff without time for it to people that really have a chance to come to grips with it. We're just barely starting to come to grips with the graduation requirements for proficiency based. Principals are still nervous about that, working on that. Mm -hmm. So having the time to do those things, I think that's going to be really important that the AOE is properly staffed with the right people. Uh, and I really do have a big believer in district management group as well, providing resources to principals, uh, special educators, teachers, so that they actually can implement these these uh, instructional best practices in a way that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So they will need support. Uh, just to say we're going to leave it up to the principals and superintendents. Some places where they have really strong leadership, that, that'll probably be okay. Other places it'll be a nightmare. They really will need support from the agency of education. They're going to have to leave this for this to work. Um, and you can see my comments on extraordinary services. And then concluding thoughts, I think I've touched on all of those. And again, I think providing more flexibility, cutting red tape, will allow us to use our resources better in all of our schools. So without taking any questions that you might have, any other questions? Other questions? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the, you mentioned the DMG consulting, um, and I think that that's also to the good. Um, one of my questions in terms of this is there, the UVM people who rolled out the yeah. plan originally so very clear, they said it about five times. If you if you want to spend less, you have to change the practices. Exactly. Um, and so that's one of the pieces that's direct at changing the practices. But it's not it's not articulated in the bill. It's we're you know we're gonna hire some consultants. Mm -hmm. um, and so in in a certain way we're jumping off a cliff here. We're we're changing the model to a census-based model. As you said, the timeline is somewhat aggressive. It's going to start rolling. And then we're counting on you know, this change in culture, change in practice, 
partially sparked by these consultants. Um, just counting on that to go forward and manifest, um, as opposed to the bill mm, describing what that new set of practices looks like. Or I'm not sure how, how or if that can be addressed in this bill, but it, it does make me a little um, a little nervous to just have one section that says, here's $200,000 for consulting services. That, that takes care of changing the system. The rest of the bill is mostly around um, changing the financing. Right. So we're, we're freeing up the financing, putting no restrictions on it, letting individual superintendents and principals and school boards make the decisions, and teachers, and hoping that, and, and I like your optimism about, I, I think you're right, small schools, and the fact that you've got eyes on the kids and their needs and their IEP teams, everything very localized. Right. I think that gives us an advantage in hoping that that all pans out. But it is it is a little bit uh, you know, nerve wracking. It's not, it's, it does the horse come first or the car? It's one of those situations for sure. And I think you could, you could work with people on instructional best practices and delivery of services for students that have challenging issues. Mm -hmm. But until you can actually really do it, until the mechanism allows you to do it in a way that yeah. makes sense at your local level, right. you're not. How can you do it? Right. Yeah. You know, Sometimes like you have yeah. to jump off the cliff a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Before you, you know, before you go forward with uh, trying to do that. Yeah. So it's definitely, it is definitely a, a scary proposition. The other thing too is the the instructional best practices that DMG cites in all of their work. Uh, they used to be district management council, and they've. Uh, Many, super, many systems have used many of those practices and have achieved savings as well as improvement in educational outcomes. So, I mean, there, there is research out there. You know, we yeah. know what to do. Uh, the other thing I will add that in Vermont, we tend to add layers upon the layers. There have been times where our special ed rules in the state are even more uh, tight than the federal rules. And remember, IEPs will still be in place. Student goals will still be in there. IEP teams will still be holding uh, education systems accountable to delivering the services that are in the IEP. But if it's me and it's my kid, I'd rather have a high-notch math teacher providing him <coughs> instruction than having a paraeducator giving them extra support now and then or, or whatever it might be, or a special right. educator who may not know any more about math than you know, my kid already does. Other questions or comments for Jay? Well, thank you, Jerry. You're very welcome. Appreciate it very much. Yep. Thank you. We've, we've got somebody from DMG on the phone. Listen to that. And they have to be done by 3.30, so I want to make sure we, um, because I would like to hear about what so, these uh, consulting services you work. Turn that on? Sure. <coughs> Nathan Levinson? Hi. Hi, uh, I'm Phil Baruth. I'm a uh, senator from Chittenden County. I'm chairing the Senate Education Committee. And I'm joined by Senator Ballant, Senator Bray, Senator Ingram, and Senator Benning, um, as well as a few people watching in the room. Um, I'm hoping that you might begin by uh, the bill we're looking at calls for an appropriation of a couple hundred thousand dollars for consulting services that DMG would provide around best practices for special ed services. I'm wondering if you can just give us a sketch of what you might do in those uh, settings if you're hired. Sure, great, no, my, my pleasure and I'm glad to answer all your questions, but also, so you know, I do have a hard stop at 3.30, so if yep. we Mm -hmm. want to continue this at another time, also happy to do that. Um, I think the, but to answer that question, I think the model we would use is a model that we have been using in Vermont um, already in a couple different settings, one around special education work that led to uh, our recent study and also the work we've been doing uh, with Act 46 districts. And the idea is to First of all, to bring multiple districts and SUs together. Uh, and we want to do that for two reasons. 
Uh, one, there's actually a lot of positive peer pressure. Um, when you have multiple uh, districts or SUs together, whoever is moving the quickest actually helps set the pace for the others. There's obviously a lot of learning that comes from one district to another. A lot of support comes from one district to another. And it is uh, vastly more economical as well. So we can help a lot more people that way. Uh, we would be bringing folks together to really do, I think, three things. One is to provide more detailed learning, uh, knowledge sharing about what are these best practices in, in far greater detail. Because if you can't really understand the nuances, the specifics of them, you run the risk of implementing something that looks kind of similar, but not actually what it should be. So there's a knowledge sharing component. Uh, the second part is we tend to structure this work uh, so that um, there's roll up the sleeve time to actually work and plan. So you know we, we bring together leadership teams uh, from the districts and SUs we're supporting, and by creating kind of a safe, structured space, uh, we help them plan, and we have our own consultants available in real time to help them um, address challenges or share best practices. We also help the planning through what we call coaching calls, where we will call in maybe once a month or once every other month with the team, where we're asking both for updates, but also they get to share with us uh, obstacles or challenges they're having that are very specific to their individual schools or district, and we can help answer them. And then the last thing we do when we pull people together is we're constantly asking them, what are the things that are getting in their way? What are they trying to implement that are, is challenging? And so they're setting the agenda, and then we can share back with them uh, how we've seen other districts and other SUs be able to implement this. And if we know there are other places in Vermont that have successfully implemented it, uh, creating a forum for them uh, to share how they've overcome it. So it's both knowledge, support, positive peer pressure, both on a group level and on an ind individual uh, district or SU level. So that's a quick overview. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you for that. I'm, I'm wondering, um, in terms of the way this bill works, it's asking for uh, the funding model to begin undergoing its change and then these best practices to feed in uh, behind it and, and I'm wondering does that strike you as realistic in terms of time frame to, to make the changes in practice that need to be made? Probably not. Um, but what we have found and we've helped a lot of SUs and districts across the country make these changes um, these are big changes. I mean, I, I think they're great for kids, they're great for the budget, but, but they're not simple and they're not small. And I, I do think it's important for everybody to recognize that the current amount of money districts spend on special education is required given their current practices. You know, there's not waste here. There's nothing. So our belief is, and we fully support, you know, the findings of the UVM report, but that to spend differently, districts have to serve differently. And the two, the two challenges are that, you know, districts cannot unilaterally change IEPs. I mean, they are binding contracts with parents. Um, so you need to, we need to help bring along parents and wanting to have a different service delivery model. We need to help uh, districts and schools change their service delivery model, change the kinds of folks and the number of folks they're hiring. And when you do those things, I think you're the, you know, the, the census-based funding model makes lots of sense and <coughs> lots of good things can happen. But our, our experience is you have to change the services, which will take time and buy-in from others, parents, staff in particular, and then you can get all the good benefits that you may be hoping for, both academically, 
social, emotionally, and financially. But it doesn't turn on a dime, unfortunately. Yeah. Oh, questions from the rest of the committee? <coughs> um, well, we have your report to work from, and the thing that I, I was most hoping to find out from you would, was the, the shape of what you were planning to do. So I, I heard you saying you would be convening large uh, or large-ish groups of um, administrators and teachers. And uh, mm -hmm. is there, is there do, local, um, you know, do you, do you then follow up with s something more specific with individuals or uh, online stuff or yep. after that uh, first set of larger meetings, what would happen? Yeah, so uh, two points and great. So yeah, first is, you know, we, we believe that support needs to be multiple years. You know, a, a year is not enough. Uh, second is, I agree completely that we, we want to share some things to the large group collectively, and then we also support each individual <coughs> district or SU in their specific requirements, and that's done typically through coaching, you know, video conferences, uh, sharing data back and forth. But yeah, there's definitely both group efforts <coughs> and district-specific efforts. Uh, the other piece, and again, depending on the funding level, and this may be something that districts themselves uh, would have to fund. One of the things you'll notice in our report, and you know, I've been all across your state talking about this report and these findings, and I'm happy to say that a lot of people feel very excited by it. Scared, but very excited. Uh, but one area that's really come up is that better scheduling is a key part of getting kids extra time to learn. It's a key part to having far more social emotional behavioral support with the staff you have. Better scheduling will lead to more kids getting high content, high quality uh, reading instruction. And we've had a lot of requests from school systems to help with their schedules. And scheduling, as you can imagine, isn't even a district level activity, it is a building level activity. So whether that, so that's an element that may have to be above and beyond what you're uh, thinking about because that's so micro, school by school. Do you mean above and beyond what we're thinking about in terms of the appropriation or? Yeah. So, yeah. so it, would, it would just cost more to have you undertake that. Right, and that might be something that individual schools and districts could also afford on their own. Because the way I tend to think about it is, you know, if I were in your shoes, and I'm happy that I'm not, um, is there are lots of economies <coughs> scale for us to be able to help, you know, a state to help multiple districts at once, and that seems to be perhaps a really <coughs> powerful use of uh, state dollars. Um, I think when you get down to scheduling, there's very little economy of scale. Like how I schedule. You know, the Robert Kennedy School is of no value to anybody other than mm -hmm. the principal and the teachers in that one school. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't lower my cost to then go help the school next door. So scheduling is just the one area in which um, there's definitely a need, there's a want, uh, but there's very few economies of scale. Fortunately, it's not super expensive on a school-by-school -school basis either. But that's maybe the... So the one area in which it's, as I said, there are no economies of scale, mm -hmm. where both the other kinds of things we can do uh, really help us leverage uh, whatever appropriation you can make. Ken, um, I know this is kind of an ignorant question, but can you just break down what you mean by scheduling? Um, sure. Uh, great. So if you. If you think about our some of the best practices that and some of the opportunities we identified, one is that kids with uh, who struggle 
get extra time during the day to learn. Another is that kids never get pulled out of core instruction in reading and math. Uh, those two examples require that the master schedule for the building include time for when those kids could get that extra help. And it needs to coordinate all the schedules in the school so that a speech therapist or an occupational therapist or um, somebody isn't pulling a student out of his classroom while reading was being taught. All of those kind of activities are driven by school and staff schedules. And it, from what we have thought in our research and what I hear regularly is that building those kind of schedules where all those good things happen and none of the bad things happen is uh, it's challenging for a lot of people. Uh, we happen to be very good at it. We happen to have technology and techniques for doing it. But a lot of the principals and superintendents I've spoken to have said, hey, we want to implement many of these best practices, but our schedules don't allow it. Um, so it is an area in which there have been requests for help um, and some in an area in which we can help folks, but that it, it would, I think, increase the, the cost above what you're currently thinking about. And it may be a cost that schools and districts themselves might want to bear. Okay. Senator Briggs. Um, so I have a question that's really um, on a different, related, but not, not part of this exact conversation, and that is, we are, uh, we, there's a bill moving that uh, pushes uh, special education services into uh, approved independent schools. And uh, I don't know the total number of students that would be served in this way, but are, as part of your consulting, are you being asked to look at how the special education services in the state of Vermont would be affected either programmatically or fiscally by implementing services in that manner? Uh, no, that was not part of the scope of our work. So we, we've not looked at that. But so I mean, if you came and back not in. Not provide any insight. Okay. Sorry. So well, say that again? Well, I think we're also talking about uh, additional future consulting work, correct? Oh. That was my impression. So, okay. Oh, all right. Well, so certainly, must, we have not historically, must, we would certainly be more than able to in the future. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Levinson. I know you have uh, somewhere you have to be. So we will um, say goodbye for now, but keep you on our list. We may have additional questions about the consulting aspect of this, but I appreciate the help. And my pleasure, and anything we can do to help you all in the state will be our pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. business of selling you their stuff. So he's like, you know, we've got this great scheduling thing that we won't be able to do for you because you're not spending it. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm thinking, what he described seemed relatively straightforward. It's hard to see how you Yeah, it sounded like someone um, operated it. And yeah, and, and maybe not even software. And it really is. He had a couple of basic principles for how you would set up the schedule. You have a scheduler already right. with those basic principles. Couldn't somebody, mm -hmm. um, but although I think you're right, it's probably a software ask, product. Ask Jeannie about the simplicity of scheduling. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, I mean, it's like it could just get complicated. I'm going to go back through it and reread the DMG report again. Yeah, that's right. Um, but 
I always <laughs> think that the you know the suggestions are never as concrete as you quite would like them to be. Um, best practices sort of puts everything in this rosy light, um, but I just keep coming back to the idea that we're you know there's it's built on a lot of hopeful. So, yeah. And sometimes, I'm not saying this is true in this case, but it does seem like fairly often when you're working on a consulting basis with someone, there's, there'll be uh, a glimpse of something, but it requires an extension of your work to get to that deliverable. Mm -hmm. And then there's a glimpse of something else. And right. So. Same with therapy. <laughs> you know, we've made really good progress this year. Therapy. Came to see me for another five years. <laughs> you'll, you'll be much better. So I think that's all we're, we're going to do for the week. So this week was um, trying to get up to speed on the bill. I think we have a pretty good understanding of what's in it, what the questions are. We've got next week a couple of weeks or a couple of days of witnesses just to um, go over some of the ground that the house covered with their witnesses. Uh, just so you know, I think it's, is it Wednesday of next week? Um, we have, I don't know if you saw, but the student walkout. Right. Um, the house had the idea of having a joint hearing where we uh, listened to those students about why they walked out, uh, et cetera. So we, we will do that with them. Especially because some of them got a snow doubt. Yes, yeah. and Montpelier in particular will be scheduled for next Wednesday, so we're going to coincide with that.